Welcome to our webinar. My name is Alastair Roth. I'm the Executive Director at AAA Victoria, and it's great to have you with us. Uh, we've got some new members of the Institute joining us, so uh, a very warm welcome to you. Same to other members of AAA from all around the country and to our other guests. Just some um, brief housekeeping before we start. We'll take questions uh, sort of in the second half. Um, you can type your questions in the Q&A tab in the uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can vote on questions posed by other people, and we'll send out a recording um, anyway after the event. So to today's webinar, to discuss the topic of empathy on the ballot, and it's, it's an interesting way of looking at the world, the, the part that empathy plays uh, not just in, in leadership but in politics too, we're joined from London by Dr. Claire York. Claire is a researcher at International Security Studies and the Jackson Institute of Global Affairs at Yale University. She's recently completed a two-year Henry Kissinger postdoctoral fellowship. And what she researches is the, the role and, and limitations of empathy and emotions in international affairs, in, in diplomacy, in policy, and and in leadership so claire thank you very much for joining us uh, great of you to make the time welcome and i'll hand over to you thank you so much for having me and good morning from london um i want to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about what empathy means in the united states election and then i would love to discuss some of the themes with you and answer any questions and it's been really interesting to note how prominent empathy has been within this election most notably for Joe Biden, who centered his campaign on empathy and on ideas of hope and unity and love and light. But it's really interesting to note how uh, President Trump has also been using empathy. And the Republican National Convention recently repeated these themes and really championed the president's empathy. So I want to get into some of the tensions within that and what that means going forward and why it matters that empathy is on the ballot. So it's actually not the first time that we've seen empathy play an important role in the election. During a presidential town hall of 1992, we saw empathy play a crucial role in shifting the electoral fortunes away from the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush, towards his challenger, Bill Clinton. And it was striking to see the way in which it happened when a woman in the audience asked about the rising problem of national debt. And she asked, how has it affected your lives? And can you truly claim to be able to solve America's problems if you have no experience of the economic woes facing normal people? Um, I have to apologize, I've got a cold, so my voice is going slightly. Um, and it's the contrast in that answers was striking. George H.W. Bush struggled to respond. He couldn't get his head around the question and he couldn't understand how his lack of experience with poverty or with debt precluded him from being able to find solutions to the challenges that were facing normal American people. He asked her to repeat the question and he intellectualized it. Couldn't really connect with her or with the implications that she was asking. In contrast, Bill Clinton stood up off his stool and in his very charismatic way, spoke of what he had experienced and his personal conversations with Americans across the country. And he would say, in my own area, I know the people by name who have lost their jobs. I know the businesses that are going bankrupt and I'm familiar with those who have lost everything because I have been talking to people and they are sharing this and I know what this feels like. And it's seen as the feel your pain moment in American politics. He doesn't actually say, um, I feel your pain, but he really expresses that he understands not only what they are going through, but also why they're going through it, what the root causes are for the problems of debt and unemployment and suffering that Americans are experiencing. He didn't just feel their pain, he offered a vision for how he would help alleviate it. And a lot of commentators at the time spoke about how this was a real turning point in that election. Um, and I think it's interesting to see the candidates today invoking this idea of empathy again and trying to show that they, at this critical moment in American politics, understand what is going on and how people feel um, so what do we mean by empathy? Um, it has a number of different meanings, but at its most basic sense, it's 
an attempt to understand the perspectives and experiences and the feelings and worldviews of others. And I refer to it as an attempt rather than an ability because we can never fully understand how other people feel, feel and experience the world. But the very act of attempting to view the world through the eyes of others, to realize that our own worldview is not the only worldview, is in itself important. And empathy is distinct from compassion and sympathy. Compassion and sympathy are often about feeling for someone, um, associated often with ideas of pity and ideas of alleviating suffering. Whereas empathy is more about a process of trying to understand what other people are experiencing. And for me, a key part of this definition is the ability for self-reflection, the ability to look at the way in which our own words and our own actions and behaviors have an impact on others and the implications. And in politics, it's also awareness of what has gone before, the history of people's involvement in politics, their experience of politicians, their, their cumulative um, encounters with um, political life and those who seek to offer changes for them. So I have three key takeaways for why empathy is on the ballot and why it is so important. Firstly, empathy is crucial for connection. It's critical in politics um, because it shows people that they are seen, that they are heard, and that they matter. And I think it speaks to a very human need that we all have to be recognized and to feel like we are an equal and we are respected within society. And politics is ultimately about people. So I think it's really right that we're giving empathy more attention and that it's being the feature of so many discussions um, around the American election right now. And also in other places, we're seeing it in discussions related to the leadership of Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and to the responses to the pandemic from a number of other countries. My second takeaway is that there's different forms of empathy and understanding its variable role is important. And I want to just touch on a couple of these elements. Um, I won't go into great detail on all of them, but I think we, th we think about empathy as an interpersonal uh, connection, the ability to connect with somebody, to feel um, their pain, but also to understand where they're coming from. It can be associated with ideas of rapport, of building a connection and having a sense of, I know that person, I know what they've been going through, and I am able to build a relationship with them. We then have, which is what I think we're seeing, particularly now, this political and strategic form of empathy, which is used to communicate and connect with people as part of political discourse and to convey to people that you care, that they matter to you. And often when we talk about empathy in an interpersonal sense, it's about the individual connection between two people. But in the political and strategic space, we see it much more about that connection between an individual or a group of individuals Collecting with a connect collective, connecting with a group of people and trying to show that collectively they are being seen and they are being heard. And that makes it much harder to conceptualize. Um, but that's what I think we're seeing right now. The third is this idea of performance, performative empathy. Um, and I think this is interesting because it points to the difference between performance and sincere empathy. And how do we differentiate the two? How do we know if someone really means it or if they're doing it because they know it matters without necessarily the authenticity or sincerity to back it up? And then the third point um, is that there's a difference between rhetoric and reality. Real empathy is hard work. It's a process. It's very easy to say, I feel your pain and you matter to me, but to actually put empathy into practice, to actually try to build um, an empathetic dialogue and a process of really understanding and tolerating difference in order to connect across divides is a real challenge that is going to endure beyond the election uh, result on the 3rd of November. Empathy is political and it's so important right now because of the tensions and divides in American society. But translating it from campaign message to a practical approach is going to present many more problems and uncomfortable conversations. So I'm going to focus primarily on the domestic uh, dimension, but I will then turn to the international. Um, and I think why, America, uh, why empathy is so needed right now is because we 
I was seeing America at a crisis point. I left America on the 1st of July, and so was there for a lot of the um, early pandemic response and also for the protests um, and the um, anger and frustration with police brutality and the racism. And you see from the news media and from uh, talking to people from social media and various other forums, um, there are a number of huge divisions in society right now. And so empathy is needed as a political response to address these challenges, because there's clearly those who view the vision that uh, President Trump offers of law and order, um, of America first and America returning to greatness. Um, you see them finding it very hard to grapple with why people are protesting. Why are people calling for justice and equality and end to police brutality? Um, and this inability to see the world through the eyes of others is going to make it very hard to reconcile the tensions and divisions within society. And this is something that uh, Joe Biden during the Democratic National Convention and throughout his campaign has really been talking about. We need to move beyond this tension and this conflict within society. We have to be having conversations about how we can make America more unified, how we can have a far more cohesive society, and how we can heal some of these wounds, how we can heal the legacy of racism and systemic and structural injustices within the country. Um, and so empathy is really critical to that. And it's also um, made harder by the strength of feeling and the identity politics that we're seeing, the fact that people are very attached to either their love of Trump or their hate of Trump um, as president, or they very want, much want to see a very different form of politics, um, whether that's more of the kind of uh, left politics that's offered by people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren that's really about reimagining the economy and society and welfare within society, or whether it's more the vision offered um, by people like Joe Biden that's more in the center of the left, but again is being called out by the Republicans as um, a radical new vision of America that wants to transform what it means to be American and is a danger um, to American identity. And it's very hard to overcome this. Um, but we see, therefore, empathy as part of a means by which to try to guide a way through, to navigate society through this. And it's also part of the personality of Joe Biden. And he's known and has long been known as a connector within American politics. When um, he was in the administration as vice president for President uh, Barack Obama, he was known to be the person who would um, work the networks to get people on side to make uh, the politics really happen. He is being championed within his campaign videos as someone who takes the time for everybody. He knows the names of the conductors on his Amtrak train that he takes on his regular commute to Washington DC. He is someone who will stop and take selfies with people in lifts and he will remember people's names. And there was a really powerful story in the um, Democratic National Convention of how he'd helped a 13 year old boy with a stutter and said, I know what you're going through. I had a stutter too, you can do this. Um, and so he's, it's seen as it's very integral to his character. And the Democrats are really keen on um, campaigning on this idea of character and on virtues and values that are critical to reviving America's sense of position within the world. Um, and they view it as a contrast to President Trump, who they view as someone who is vulgar, who is misogynist, who um, is racist, and who um, doesn't conform to the normal norms and expectations of politics within America. So they're really pitching it as light against darkness. And you saw this theme within the Democratic National Convention. There is light represented by Joe Biden and his care for Americans. And then there is <clears throat> the darkness, which we're seeing under um, which they're arguing we're seeing under a president who hasn't really cared about all Americans and is only interested in self-interest. Um, so Biden's running very much as a healer in chief. Um, but we also see it in its performative power because empathy signals care and it also humanizes po politicians. And as the public, I think we also have to look at how much do we expect it? Do we ever expect to see politics where our 
politicians when campaigning don't express that they understand where we're going, where we're coming from and why we matter to them. Um, but this performative dimension means we're also seeing this from President Trump and the Republican National Convention. And in their national convention, they showed Trump as being incredibly caring for frontline workers. And he met with um, people who'd been at the front of the crisis response to the pandemic and thanking them for their efforts. We saw him meeting hostages who had been detained overseas during his uh, time in office and that he had helped uh, release. We also saw a lot of personal accounts from colleagues, from people like White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany, um, who spoke about how President Trump had supported her during um, a very difficult mastectomy um, and had called her personally. And she was not the only one to do this, this kind of repeated um, account and character reference given of Trump during the RNC. Um, so they're very conscious of the importance of it. And I think one of the challenges for empathy when we talk about it in this context is that it's really easy to focus on characters like Biden who are known as being connected, being people who care, whether or not you like or agree with their politics. Um, but the direction of empathy here also matters. Who is being empathized with and why is that important? And for the Democrats, it's really critical that they understand why Trump resonates with a lot of people across America. Um, what is it that he's saying that they connect with? Because however um, vulgar or uncouth people find his messages, um, he's speaking about unemployment, he's speaking about jobs and insecurity. Um, and he's also speaking about the mistrust for the political elite. And for a lot of people, um, who are supportive of Trump, that connects with things that they've experienced. They do not have trust in Washington DC and the people who rep represent the political elite. They feel left behind by a liberal international agenda. They feel like they've not been served by the promises that repeated politicians have asked them. And I think it's really interesting. There's a new book uh, coming out by Michael Sandel that looks at, at um, meritocracy and how the system has failed working class people. Um, and I think there's a, therefore this need for Democrats to really do this process of self-reflection of how is it that Democrat politics in the last kind of 10 years has maybe failed to deliver on the promises that we believe it will deliver on, that we um, maybe haven't understood or have marginalized certain people with this pursuit of um, opportunity and uh, potential within society. And I think that's a really in interesting and important conversation that has to take place in order to really understand why um, Trump has such power and resonance that he does and why people really feel like he sees them in a way that no one else has. And I spent time over the past few years in America um, and a lot of people felt like he says it as it is. He's no nonsense. Um, he will deliver on what he says he will deliver. And yes, he is vulgar and yes, he might be problematic, but they didn't believe that other politicians were less corrupt um, or better. And that, I think, is something that is really important to grasp. I think what's interesting is thinking now about what will happen on November the 3rd. And I'm curious to see whether Donald Trump's comments about veterans and military personnel will expose this lack of care, that actually his discussion about empathy, this performance of empathy that we saw at the Republican National Convention is actually a myth. And really at the heart of it, <clears throat> there isn't that real care and compassion for the everyday American, for people who give their lives in service. And whether that will maybe expose the myth for um, those who still believe that he has their interests at heart. And it'll be interesting to see how that shifts. And it's hard looking on social media because Twitter uh, replicates our own uh, bubbles and the algorithms that we follow. Um, but a lot of people are talking about how military personnel are turning away from him. And they've been often some of the most diehard kind of committed to uh, President Trump. So will Biden build back better? And this is really where we get to the third point and the hard work of empathy. Um, and put aside whether or not uh, Donald Trump will leave office or honor the results if Biden wins, um, and putting aside as well talks that there may be violence or chaos, whatever the result, I think the huge challenge um, 
for uh, those who are promoting empathy in this election, and especially for people like Joe Biden, if he does win, is how do you then turn rhetoric into practice? How do you reconcile the divide and have the conversations? Um, not just addressing the structural and systemic problems of inequality and the lack of uh, opportunities, problems with health and welfare and housing and employment and the economy that we've seen and that we're very familiar with, and also with justice um, and police violence. <clears throat> How do you have the conversations? And we're seeing in America this kind of different movements, particularly cancel culture. There's a lot of discussions around wokeness and what this means, this, uh, what some people view as policing of conversation, but what other people think is very essential calling out of um, prejudices and biases um, and ideas that no longer have a place within political discourse. So how do you reconcile that? And this is where it gets political because it means saying to people, we have to be able to have a dialogue with people that we don't agree with. We have to be able to find areas of common ground, even while setting boundaries, even while saying this language, these ideas are inappropriate and they have no space within our political system and within our political discourse. Um, but that is a huge job and it takes real leadership and ability to be seen as credible to both sides, to be seen as being trustworthy to both sides and someone who will really guide the conversation in a way that is constructive. And this actually isn't just about leadership. This is not just about the presidential candidate. This is about a commitment from both parties, a commitment by people of all political stripes and colors to be able to say, I'm willing to get on board with this process. And that's where it's going to be very difficult. And so we see empathy on the ballot, but the actual work and the process of empathy is going to be something that we we'll have to see within society as a whole. And as much as I believe in the power of empathy, and I really do, I think it is integral to change society and create better politics. I'm very cautious about how easy and how, um, how that process will go because I think it's going to be hard and very, very difficult. Um, and the final point I want to make is about the international because I think it's really interesting to look at what this means internationally. We've seen over the last few years America really disengage from a lot of the world. We've seen Donald Trump has gone his own way. Um, he hasn't necessarily been a reliable partner for allies here in Europe um, and elsewhere around the world. We've seen him threaten to withdraw from international organizations. We've seen him actually withdraw funding and support from international organizations. And so it'd be interesting to see whether or not Biden will be able to repair that, how quickly he might repair that if he were to win. And it comes back again to this idea of self-reflection because as someone who spent time in America, um, I was conscious of how there isn't this ability to reflect on how America's power might be diminished by its handling of the pandemic, of the inequalities and injustices within society. Um, and it's been harmed by cumulative efforts, but particularly, I think, by President Trump. But how does America come to terms with its diminished role? How does it look at the protests, the response to the pandemic, and recognize that it's not done enough? Um, and that it's very hard for other countries to now look at America and see it as a world leader. So how much will it seek to understand, to empathize, and to listen and engage with other states, and to be a team player and not a leader, to not assume that it is the best solution to the world's problems, because the world, I think, will look at it and no longer believe that that is uh, credible, at least for a few years while the repair is being done. So it's hard to say what will happen there. Um, we have seen other people um, we have seen other leaders do it. We saw, for example, Nelson Mandela in South Africa able to unite a country and bring it together. Um, but it takes, it takes real leadership and a real kind of sense of character and vision to do that. Um, so to conclude, I, I'm really encouraged that we're seeing so much conversation about empathy and that we're seeing it feature so prominently within an election campaign where it is so needed. Um, but as I've said, I think it has to go beyond rhetoric. Um, it's a collective and community endeavor that we all have to um, be conscious of. Um, and particularly for, I think, Americans, they have to be aware of that investment in dialogue and engagement with difference 
and tolerating the fact that there are different worldviews that may be unpalatable and finding ways to navigate that in order to identify common ground of what does security mean to you? What does prosperity mean? What does opportunity mean? Why do you want the economy to work in certain ways? How does that benefit you? How can we think differently about healthcare, about law and order, um, about justice and education in order to create a much more cohesive and unified society? So it's very much about um, cohesion and finding common paths. Um, so I want to strike an opt optimistic note and say I, it's possible, um, but it would be naive to believe that it's easy and naive to believe that somehow on the 3rd of November, if a new president comes in or if um, there is a new administration, that it will somehow bring about a radical change. It's going to be a process. And I think it's something we're going to be watching for the next um, five to 10 years as society tries to grapple with what has been taking place over there. So thank you so much. And I'm really happy to uh, answer any questions and to engage in a conversation around this topic. Absolutely, that's great. Uh, Claire, thank you very much. There's some really good questions coming in. We'll get through um, as many in we, as we can in the uh, 30 odd minutes we've got to us. Um, perhaps I can just pitch one to, to kick it off. Uh, how, how much do you think Biden um, empathetic focus, uh, being a connector and so on, is, is helping Trump push his law and order pitch. I, you know, you need someone with a firm hand here versus a, a soft touch. Yes, I think it's really, it's really interesting to see this. And I think the problem is, is that they're talking to different audiences. And so I, what I'm curious about is how much Biden's ability or his pitch that he's a connector and ability to and able to heal America is actually able to speak to people who want to see law and order, who want to see the kind of hard hand of the law stop protests and kind of prevent um, some of the um, protesting and the campaigns to have a different conversation about America. And I'm not sure that those two audiences are easy to talk to each other, that they're willing to talk to each other. So I think what what Biden will have to do is be able to say, this is how we're also going to deal with um, the issues about justice within society. These, this is how we have to both support ideas of um, security and law and order, but we're going to imagine it in a different way. And he has to be able to offer policy approaches and a vision of what that then might look like, so that then it recognizes the need for security that the people who view Trump as saying something valid to speak about, while also being true to the kind of ideals he has that we actually need to rethink the whole idea of how we're doing this. And that's hard. Um, there's, a, there's a question here. I'm just trying to find it. Now. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, how, how do you think that um, Biden and Trump will try and display empathy in the upcoming presidential debate when they're face to face? Oh, I think that is going to be fascinating. And I think it goes back to that Bush Clinton dimension. I think, and I think this is where I'll admit my biases. I think Biden comes across as naturally warmer. He comes across as someone that I think will listen. And I would have thought because he's really running on this platform, he will take the time to probably engage much more with audience members, to use his experiences. And he's unique in the sense between the two of them and that he's really experienced tragedy and loss and grief. And I think that gives you a humility and a sense of understanding that's very painful, but very real. And I think it'll be interesting to see whether uh, Donald Trump is able to tap into his personal experiences in the same way. Um, and we've not really seen that a huge amount. We haven't seen him really use his childhood experiences. We haven't really seen him use his professional experiences as a source of connection. He uses it as a way to convey his abilities and his strength of his expertise, you know, that he's a great businessman and that he's done a huge amount for business and the economy, but we don't see him really talking about his vulnerabilities. And critical to empathy in this very, um, personal sense is the ability to connect through your vulnerabilities. Um, and so I'm, I'd be interested to see it. I'm curious whether it's something they can teach him so that he performs, but then I wonder whether it will appear sincere. But again, it depends where you sit 
um, you know, politics is very much about where we sit and what we perceive, and that changes depending on what we're looking for. Yeah. Well, you actually, you've picked up one of the questions that was coming up, which is a great one. Is, is fake empathy useful or counterproductive? In other words, can the public at large detect sincerity or, or insincerity? Um, so I, I love this question because it's something I struggle with too as, as a scholar of empathy. Um, I, do, I do think it works to a point. I think, I think you can fake it but it doesn't mean you're going to make it. And I think that the public actually have quite an intuitive grasp of where it falls apart. And I think if you, if you feel that, and again, this speaks to emotions and why emotions are so critical in politics, like facts are important, but if you do not feel they resonate with you, they won't resonate with you. They won't make sense to you. They have no logic. So um, therefore I think if people feel that Donald Trump, connects with them as an outsider, as someone who doesn't fit in within normal society and politics, as someone who champions the little guy who doesn't have the voice, the person who's lost his job, the person who um, wants to see America be great again, you will probably tolerate and be able to see empathy for far longer than those who just cannot connect with Donald Trump, who don't see him as in any way sincere about caring for American people. And so I think it will work. I think, I do think the, um, his comments and his derision of military personnel this past week have hurt him. Um, I think it's very hard to believe that he cares when he will speak that way about military veterans. Um, and I'm, but I wonder for his diehard supporters, they're still, they know what he's like. And I was surprised how many people I spoke to who said, Oh, we know that he's uncouth and he's vulgar, but he says it as it is, and that's what we want. Um, so I think that's what matters. So that's that's what they perceive as him being empathetic. <laughs> yeah, they see him as speaking to them. What um, what role do you think, um, if, if any, do do the vice presidential candidates play in in making their presidents look empathetic? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think I, I saw some commentary about um, the Vice President Pence was really someone that people felt gave a more empathetic speech during the Republican National Convention, that he's someone that's, I think people view him as kind of an anchor to Trump, because we don't actually see very much of him. We see him as kind of, you know, the silent guy behind the scenes, um, someone who kind of keeps things going and keeps things on course. Um, which I think maybe some people feel comfort in. Um, and I think on the Democrat side with Kamala Harris, um, I think she is, she is very good at bringing in um, different demographics. Like she's much younger. It's so great to see a woman on the ticket as well. And I think she speaks to people in a very different way. She's got different experience to Biden. She's also someone that comes across as quite uh, warm. She's not unproblematic though too. I know some people really... Um, have spoken that she's she's not necessarily without fault, but I think all of our politicians are going to be human. They're all going to have their faults and their strengths. Um, and so I think she connects with a different demographic that had hoped that this election there would be a younger female candidate, or at least that there would be maybe um, a person of colour on the ticket. She'll bring in new voices, and I think she's shown that she's very committed to bringing in different ideas. Uh, just, just moving um, sort of a, a bit wider. Back to your first example on um, on Bill Clinton. Is is there a danger that um, charisma can be conflated with empathy? I think there is. You know, I mean, I think I think charisma is it's that inalienable ability to make people feel like they are the only person that matters in a room, and that's in many ways what empathy does. It makes you feel like you matter in your scene. Um, and, but I think from people who speak about Bill Clinton, they say he genuinely did connect. He remembered people's names from 10, 20 years ago. He just had this innate and rare ability to remember people and connect with them. And so it was charisma, but I think there was also something genuine in there. Um, but charisma can also be smoke and mirrors. And I think it lasts, again, like this idea of fake empathy. Charisma can last for a certain period. And then people start to go, there's no substance behind that. There's no content. They're not actually 
reflecting on what I've told them. They don't seem to understand. It's all just words. And I think people eventually start to lose trust. I think they give you the benefit of the doubt for far longer because you seem engaging and warm and um, genuine. And then eventually they start to realize there's nothing behind it. And so that can maybe be more damaging to public trust. So is, um, is empathy innate or can it be taught or learned? Um, as someone that teaches empathy, I, I think it can be taught. Um, I, think you do have, I think you do have people who naturally are more innately empathetic, that they naturally feel instinctively other people's experiences or they can connect with it or they know to ask the questions and to engage with people in different ways. But I really think it's something we can learn. I think it's something we can teach. And I think it's about teaching people how to listen actively, not just listen to then speak yourself and to know what to say next, but to actually listen and to reflect on what someone is telling you and to be present and to show up and be there and um, take the time for people and as well to reflect on not only your own experiences and your own assumptions and prejudices, but also your own privileges and the positionality that you're coming from. And the more we're able to reflect on that, I think it helps us to foster it. I think empathy is a muscle. We can certainly practice it. Um, there's, a, there's a question, well, a couple of questions about the, the role of the press, but specifically yeah. because with, with so much of the press on the West and East Coasts, <laughs> denigrating Trump. Are you surprised so many in the Midwest feel empathy towards Trump? And then more widely, just what, what role has the press got to play in this? Yes, this is, this is a really important um, dimension of it, because often we talk about politicians as if they're operating in a bubble. And I know I just spoke about them without mentioning the press, but um, it's absolutely right to bring them up. I do think there is this mistrust of mainstream media. And Donald Trump's done a really strong job trying to undermine that, the trust in the media. You know, this has been a huge part of his platform since before he was president. And um, really pointing out how they represent an agenda that is not shared by those in certain parts of America. Um, and I think people, I think people are really um gravitating towards different news sources you know we're seeing this with social media we saw during the election um, in 2016 the prominence of sites such as breitbart that were telling a different account of american politics and again what's so effective about these news sources is they find an ounce of truth they found an ounce of something that people connect with and then they tell a different kind of story so people see something that connects with their life experiences and then they follow different, different stories. They follow a different route and they find something in it that speaks to them. Um, and I do think that people feel that the denigration of, uh, or the kind of the criticism of Trump is somehow part of a, a liberal elite agenda to dismiss people who they view um, are not part of that set. And I think that speaks into a powerful narrative that we've seen even since Nixon, you know, this idea that somehow there are the elite who are in control and then there's the rest of us and they don't care about us. And you see that narrative replayed. Um, and I think for the, for the media as a whole, I think, I think they need to be a crucial part of developing this conversation, of really having a dialogue about how are other people experiencing America? What are the plurality of experiences? And what does that mean for what America might look like? How do we find those points of connection? And they're in a unique position because they can reach millions of people. They can have that conversation in a way that combines story and facts without necessarily the overt political agenda. Um, and they can get into people's homes in a way that I think a lot of politicians can't. And so I think it's really, they play a critical role, but they are, what the problem we see with the media right now is it's so often led by likes and um, retweets. And so you therefore get this kind of dumbing down of the media or you get the story that sells that, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, we need to be seeing that kind of real critical engagement with the issues that shows the different sides. Um, and there are a lot of people and a lot of journalists, a lot of media who do do that. Um, but it's, it's finding that balance. Very, 
Very good. Well, we still have questions coming. We'll keep going. Uh, Claire, you suggested that the next US president, whoever it is, will need to show empathy to, to other countries that have lost faith a bit in the US leadership. Have the US elites taken on board the impact that uh, the Trump presidency has had on perceptions of the US across the world? Um, so I feel like my answers are often yes and no. Um, so I'm sorry, I like complexity and I like the, I like the nuance of it. Um, I think they are very conscious. I think that the kind of people in DC who do foreign policy are very conscious of the way in which President Trump has harmed American interests around the world. Um, I, think, I think anyone who has traveled in the last few years is very aware of how people such as in Europe view America and the kind of the confusion and the shock at the way in which it's, it's transformed so much since um, just the previous administration, which had a very, I think, positive view image in the world. You know, I think President Obama was very well liked around the world in a lot of countries. Um, but I think, I think they can see it. I think my problem that I noticed is that a lot of people are not then willing to look at the idea that America may not regain its leadership immediately. That there seems to be this idea that a new president would actually just reset where it's, where it's been. And I think actually a lot of work has to be done to rebuild trust in America. And I think people outside America want to see that efforts are being taken to address the injustices and the failings that we've seen through this pandemic crisis and through the protests, you know, it's very hard to look at a country that claims to be a champion of uh, democratic ideals and freedom and equality when you see the scale of kind of injustice and violence committed against protesters, when you see the fact that people don't have health care, who really should have health care, when you see the, that your position in life really determines the opportunities accorded to you, it doesn't ring true with the ideals that I think have so often been associated with America and the world. So I think it's going to take time and I think it takes humility. I think I really want to see a um, greater sense of humility about how much is going to have to be done to re earn a position of prominence in the same level that it had. Um, I think you've, you've partly answered the next question um, through that, but uh, if, if Biden wins the election, what would you recommend he do in his first hundred days to ensure the practice of empathy in his presidency? Ah, oh, that is a great question. Um, I think, I think first, I think there's a number of things that have to be done. I think firstly, there has to be a process of national dialogue um, that is really um, led from the White House, but is devolved across the country. I think that really does engage in, let's talk about what kind of country we want to be. Let's talk about the problems. Let's talk about how our vision of America doesn't align with your reality. And let's understand why that is. What do we really need to be doing? How do we do this? And that really engages civil society, community leaders. I think it has to be cross party. It means finding allies in the Republican party who are willing to get on board with this. And it's been interesting to see during this process, how some very prominent Republicans like Mitt Romney have actually started to talk about things like universal basic incomes. Um, so how do they, so they have to build that, but I think it has to be matched by action. And this is one thing that's very um, compelling with Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand's expressions of empathy is when she says after, when she said after Christchurch, we need unity, she also matched it with very clear action on guns control, very clear action on regulating extremism on the internet. So I think the same has to take place. There has to be efforts of saying, okay, this is what we're going to do for law and order. This is what we're going to do for healthcare. We are going to implement these core measures that will address the core vulnerabilities that we're experiencing, the core uh, kind of points that are causing people pain and anxiety and insecurity. Um, and really making a point of bringing action in to that. And then I think on the international piece, there has to be a real commitment to say to the world, we are going to come and we are going to meet with you, although maybe no one will be traveling for a little while yet. Um, we're going to have a dialogue with our allies and we are going to listen. We want to hear what you want from America or in terms of 
as an ally? What is it that we can do? How can we work with you and not kind of lead you with our own vision? How do we create a collective vision of what it means to create and build an international society? How do we hit reset after this global crisis and work together um, to ensure that we do things better in the future? So I think there's a multi-level approach to it. Absolutely, yes. And, and to, to broaden out a little bit, um, there's a question. What role do you think gender plays in empathy and in, in, in politics? Yes, brilliant. And it's been really, it's been really positive to see so much discussion about empathy and leadership through this pandemic. I, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the articles about how a number of the countries that have done have dealt with the pandemic most effectively have had women leaders. And I think it's really great that we're seeing new forms of leadership champion leadership that is about compassion, that is about really speaking to citizens and assuring citizens and being transparent. Um, and I think that's really, I think it's really good because empathy and emotions are often seen as weaknesses within politics. We've kind of prioritized rationality as if it's somehow rationality is strength and emotion is a weakness, it's irrational, it's something we can't control and we can't quantify. Um, but I also want to sound a note of caution in some ways because I, I feel like rationality is reason informed by intelligent emotion. Rationality is about really knowing emotion and how they inform your judgments because our ideas and our judgments are informed by what we value and they're things that we feel. Um, and an extreme of rationality that's devoid of emotion is as harmful as an extreme of emotion that is also irrational. So I want us to reframe rationality as being reason informed by intelligent emotion. And I want us to also move away from the idea that empathy and compassion are only female traits. I think it does a real disservice to men. It does a real disservice to compassionate, empathetic men who have led with empathy, who are listening to their citizens, who are trying to do a lot to transform society. And we need to therefore just start saying, let's just imagine different forms of leadership where emotionality is a strength, where empathy is not a weakness and where we don't need um, to view strength as kind of the strongman politics that is, that is focused on the use of force, that is focused on kind of very bullish tactics and this idea of a vision that is kind of very singular and dominant. Let's start talking about inclusive politics, about collective politics where all of society is involved and we have this dialogue. And I think men and women are equally capable of it. And the more we empower men, the more they're going to be able to express emotions that they already feel, that they already use and um, bring that into their leadership. Thank you. That's, that's very comprehensive. Um, just to come back to the election, it, it's um, by no means a, a given, of course, that um, Biden will be there in November. So let's assume if, if Trump wins, what, uh, what does that mean for the thesis? What, what uh, does that say about the importance of, of, of presidential empathy to the, the current American electorate? Yes, I, I'm not going to put any bets on who will win. I have to admit, until until the comments about military personnel, I was very worried that actually a Biden win was not a shoe in. I'm not, I'm not convinced that he was doing enough before. Um, but I wonder now if actually people are seeing the real colors of Trump and that it will, that it will change the direction much more towards Biden again. Um, but I think if, I think if Trump does win, I, I worry that divisions are going to get worse. I do worry that there is going to be this, um, escalation of tensions because for those people who cannot countenance Trump in the Oval Office again, it will be very hard to speak to people who voted him in twice. I think it's going to be very difficult to understand given the scale of the deaths from the pandemic, given the scale of the violence that we've seen in American cities and the protests, that this is, is going to be conducive going forward. And I'm, I've not seen much evidence yet, um, although in politics we are always able to be surprised that Trump is willing to listen to people on the left who want to see reforms to the police force, who want to see more health care, who want to see a change to how tax is done and employment and wealth is distributed. Um, 
And so I worry, and I think so much of his rhetoric is based on, um, on criticizing the left, that it's going to be very hard for him to come back. And maybe not impossible if he chooses that he's going to do things very differently because he wants to be popular and he wants to try to heal the nation. But we don't see that much from his character. We don't see that come through very much. Um, so I do worry that there'll be an escalation of tensions. I think we'd have to see leadership from both sides that probably is not from the president to try to heal it and to take it forward. Um, but I think empathy will be put on hold if, um, if he does win. I think there'll be a long process and a long delay. In. Yeah. So how, how, do you, how do you build dialogue with people who see <laughs> empathy um, as a weakness? I think so. I think one of the, I think one of the challenges is really trying to reframe it in terms of asking questions of the people who don't view empathy as a weakness. You know, what is what is it that you, what is it that matters to you? What is it that you value within society? Um, and really listening. I think there's a danger in political discourse, and it's not just an American phenomenon right now that. There's so much virtue signaling. We, you know, we do it on social media. We have this desire to show people that we have the right ideas and we want people to get behind us. And um, I know, um, I know, I can be as guilty as this as anyone else. Um, you know, but it's about really going. Okay, I'm going to put on hold my own assumptions and my own politics, and I'm going to listen. And then through listening, let me see if we can find that common ground. Let me see if when you say what you want is for your for your children to have good schools and be safe in their neighborhoods and you want you know to have a safe job and you want to have enough money at the end of the month to be able to save for the future okay i can get behind that whatever side of the political spectrum i'm on start to build on that and i think we also need to see far less um shaming and i think what's so interesting is we see so much shame within the political discourse right now you know and we saw it in 2016 unfortunately when hillary clinton called trump supporters that small group of trump supporters the basket of deplorables you know and and shame has very counterintuitive logics because we think when we shame someone they're going to realize that what they do is shameful and they're going to change their behavior but shame actually often forces people to entrench even deeper into their identity because they go, well, you don't see me. I, you made me feel bad. Why am I going to listen to you? So we have to be able to remove the shame from the discourse and start to go, okay, let's start talking about what kind of society and country we want. And let's talk about what that might look like. Um, but at the same time, setting very clear boundaries of racism and sexism and homophobia um, it has no place in this discourse and we will talk on these lines. So I think it has to be a conversation that doesn't mention empathy, but does the practice of what empathy actually involves, which is asking questions, listening, showing people they feel seen and really trying to understand our own role in why it is that they maybe feel that we haven't listened or we haven't shared their views or understood where they're coming from. If Claire, if we could just switch um, internationally for a second, <laughs> Out, outside of the US, you, you mentioned Jacinda Ardern in passing there. Which, which leaders do you think show the most and the least empathy? And how do they use that to their advantage? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think part of the problem is that empathy is subjective. You know, like we've already spoken about. I mean, I do think... Jacinda Ardern is a very good example of someone who's put it up front as something that she will talk about and something that she will implement into her politics. And I think that's really interesting to see. Um, those who show the least, I mean, the problem is, again, is that those who maybe show the least are probably just not showing it to people like me because my politics are very different. You know, when you talk about some of the strong leaders that we've got, um, I would not view their politics is empathetic, but to a lot of their supporters, they are seen as um, speaking to their grievances, their insecurities. Um, so I think the strong men that we see rising in a number of countries are very effective at using that lack of empathy to convey their strength, to convey a strong nationalist politics, that they're going to protect an identity, that they're going to protect a country and its people. Um, against outside threats and from internal shifts that are maybe damaging to society. Um, 
So I'm, I'm not really naming names because I'm conscious that <laughs> it'll probably involve, a, yeah, it's probably quite a difficult one. But I think, I mean, I think Jacinda Arden's a great example of someone who's doing it well. That's all right. Well, well answered. <laughs> um, <laughs> do, 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 do you think um, leaders need empathy? Uh, talking about making policy, do they need empathy for policy that uh, focuses on, 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 say, healthcare or refugee resettlement, or does it just help make better policy altogether? I think it helps make better policy altogether. And I think if you look, and I think it's about taking it, not just from leaders, but then if you go into government departments and you start to incorporate empathy into a much more granular approach towards policy design. So in like your example with healthcare or refugees, in healthcare, if you go, if, you, if people working in government say, okay, what, what does it mean nowadays to go to a hospital? What is that experience for a patient? How do they feel in that environment? And it very much speaks to this idea of design thinking that we see emerging, where we start designing the environments, we start to design policies with a view of the end user in mind. What does it mean for them? If you're, if you're traveling um, from a war-torn country to another country for safety, what might you be feeling and experiencing? And it seems so evident that you will be scared and you'll be looking for a better life because you want something better for your children and for your own, your family and for yourself. And you want to avoid insecurity and uncertainty. But we don't seem to bring that into then, what does that mean for how we design policy? What might you feel the moment you land in a new country? How do you then design policies that help people feel settled far more quickly, that listen to their concerns, but at the same time are listening to people within the country who express concerns about what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my job? And I think having that much more inclusive dialogue about how policy is experienced at the very front end, at the micro level by people, is a conversation we should be having in departments um, around the world, I think, and really part of our process of considering what makes for better policy and better societies. Absolutely. We, we're, we're coming to the, to the end of our, our time. Unfortunately, we've got through most of the questions, but maybe we've got time for one or two more. Um, yeah. how, how do you, this is back to the US again, but how, how do you communicate empathetically with people who are totally wedded to a gun culture? That one, I'm really, I don't know. I mean, I really don't understand how you can have so many shootings and, and atrocities like they've had and not want to have that conversation. And I think that's what a lot of the world finds. I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the world, I'm, uh, but I think it's very hard to understand how you do that. And I think it's really about talking about, it really involves talking about different forms of security and trying to speak to why it is people are so wedded to guns despite the scale of violence that people have seen at the hands of um, guns in various parts of American society. I think it means reframing, finding out how they view the world and trying to find a way in to say, maybe there's another way. Maybe you can have your gun, but maybe go through these checks first. Maybe don't have um, gun markets or um, fairs where you can buy guns without maybe all the necessary checks. and. But I think it speaks to a deep-seated vision of America um, and insecurities that are almost built into it from its origins that will take a long time, I think, to undo or a very particular conversation that can offer alternatives that speak to the insecurities that people feel about giving up their guns. It's one I, it's one I struggle to empathize with, I have to be honest. Yes. Well, just as, as, we, as we wrap up, I suppose, just to, to a, a brief summary from your side, are, are you on, on balance um, optimistic or, or pessimistic about the future of empathy and the, in the American landscape? Um, actually, I'm quite, I mean, I'm, I'm very uncertain about the short term. I think in the short term, there's a rocky few years ahead, whoever wins the election. But actually, I think the dialogues that are going on in America right now about race and um, sex and gender and privilege and history are positive conversations that I think need to be had. And so I think the fact that you've got this, the start and engagement with these conversations, the fact that we're seeing far more people 
um, from different backgrounds and experiences sharing their views and able to have a voice and this consciousness of the way in which there are multiple Americas that people have experienced is a positive uh, trend and I think the more that people can build on it and the more we can learn to um, be open to those conversations and the more that people in America can find ways to then navigate the dialogue with others I think there's I think there's hope. I'm going to end on an optimistic note. I think it might be a few years and a hard process, but I think, I think there's reason to be optimistic. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for ending on an optimistic note. We really <laughs> appreciate you taking the time to join us. It, it was um, a, a great coverage of quite a complex topic. We covered lots of questions. So to the audience too, thank you very much for your engagement and interest. Um, please stay safe and well out there. We've got um, many more webinars coming. Um, Claire, once again, thank you to very much. Hopefully one day you might better get the chance to travel and come and talk to us in person. But um, for now, thank you all very much indeed and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>